Good Friday morning and welcome to Begin in the Word. What is the harrowing of hell and what does that have to do with 1 Peter chapter 3? Well, that's the subject of our study this morning. I'll admit that this is a text that has perplexed me and many others for many years. And we are not going to solve all of the problems that arise from interpreting this text, but I hope to offer some potential solutions. And more importantly, there are some things in this text that are abundantly clear, and I'd like to draw those out before we conclude today. I'll say that this video will be a little more involved than some of the other videos we've done in this series on 1 Peter. We're going to be going pretty slowly, phrase by phrase, and unpacking things at a pretty detailed level. So I apologize if this video is a little longer than normal. I would encourage you to get a Bible, maybe a cup of coffee, and follow along as we jump right in. Here's what the Bible says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels and authorities and powers, having been subjected to him. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that this is a difficult text. Martin Luther said of this text, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. And I would have to echo that with an amen. It's a difficult text. I remember my father bringing this text to my attention when I was a child and, and being so perplexed and confused and digging and studying. Perhaps that was the whole point of bringing up this text to get me to do that, but digging in and studying and trying to figure out just exactly what was being said in, in, in this text. It's a difficult text and it's okay to acknowledge that. There's a lot going on here and it's important that we go through it pretty slowly. But it's also got some very clear elements. And, and one thing that is abundantly clear is that this connects to the previous parts of this chapter and of this book through this, the theme of suffering. Christ also suffered. Just as he has said in the previous parts of chapter 3 that sometimes we suffer unjustly, Christ suffered for sins. Unjustly, it was the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. The purpose of all of this is that we might be brought to God. Jesus endured suffering because there was a great outcome on the other side of that suffering. That is our redemption and salvation. So let's talk about some of the more difficult elements of this text, or perhaps we should say the more controversial or disagreed upon elements of this text. The first we've already drawn attention to. Is Peter teaching penal substitution here in verse 18, that Christ died the punishment for our sins? And it certainly looks that way, at least to me, at first pass. Christ died for our sins because of our sins. There was a debt we incurred and Christ paid that debt. Someone, though, might point out that there are many ways we can think of Christ dying for our sins. It could be that he died not as the punishment for our sins, but simply because of our sins. Our sins led to that scenario. And that's a grammatical possibility. But I cannot escape the language of the righteous for the unrighteous. In some sense, this was a substitution. We as the unrighteous deserved the suffering. That is the whole point of this the passage that we've been looking at here in 1 Peter 3. Unjust suffering. Jesus didn't deserve it. We did, but he suffered all the same. So it strikes me that there is some degree of penal substitution going on here. Perhaps we shouldn't press the language too hard into this strict forensic formula. He paid the exact debt and we get his righteousness. Some of that, perhaps we cannot get out of this text, but at a very basic level, there is a substitution going on, and it does seem to relate to the punishment for our sins. The purpose, though, is clear. It's to bring us to God. The second controversial, disagreed upon element of this text is in this last phrase of verse 18. And I'm going to go ahead and erase, I'm going to be erasing my marks probably a few times in this video so that we can keep marking it up without making the text too hard to read. What does it mean when it contrasts Jesus being put to death in the flesh with his being made alive in the spirit? 
Now, what exactly, what exactly is, does it mean when it says he was made alive? You might say, well, it's obvious. This is talking about the resurrection. Well, if it is talking about the resurrection, wouldn't Peter have said he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the flesh? Why contrast the flesh with the spirit? Because Christians have from the very beginning taught an empty, to an empty tomb. That is to say, Jesus did not just come back as a ghost, but he was in the body raised from the dead. So that the same body that went into the grave came out of that grave. And so some say, well, made alive here doesn't refer to the resurrection per se. This refers to the state in between his crucifixion and his resurrection. In the interval, he was made alive, spiritually speaking. And that is one solution to that problem. Another solution to that problem is to capitalize the S here and to make this refer to the Holy Spirit. In fact, some translations do that. I believe the NIV does that. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that certainly is possible, grammatically speaking. And then verse 19 wouldn't say in which, it would say by whom he went and proclaimed. So that's one way. Another way to, to think this through is to say that he was put to death in the flesh or in a, in a very carnal sense, but he was made alive in, in a spiritual or into the spiritual realm. He was put to death in the earthly realm and he was resurrected in the spiritual realm of existence. And don't think of the spiritual realm as something that's far away and distant, but it overlaps with our present world. And that Jesus in his resurrection enters into that new creation, as it were, the spiritual realm. And if you take that view, it's very clear that made alive does refer to the resurrection. Also, if you say that he was made alive by the Holy Spirit, it's clear that made alive here refers to the resurrection. So that's three kind of views. Either made alive is referring to the period in between his death and resurrection. And the word spirit here is he was made alive in spirit. Or it refers to the resurrection, and we have to think of the spirit here as either the Holy Spirit or as the spiritual realm. So that's one point of disagreement. And that disagreement has fingers into the rest, the rest of the text and how we're going to interpret things. Into verse 19, in which already there's controversy about these two words, in which, is it at which time? Is that what is meant there? So in the interval between his death and resurrection at that time, or maybe after his resurrection at that time, or is it in which being in the spiritual realm he went and proclaimed, or is it in whom, because spirit here refers to the Holy Spirit, in whom or by whom he went and proclaimed. So there's controversy about that. And then there's controversy about what does it mean that he proclaimed? What did he proclaim? Did he proclaim a second chance at salvation? Did he proclaim victory? Did he proclaim condemnation? The text doesn't say. And then there's some question about who are the spirits. In fact, those are the three core questions. And Wayne Grudem does a very good job in his commentary, though I must say I fundamentally disagree with his conclusion, but he does a very good job laying out the three questions that are central. Who are the spirits? What did Christ preach? And at what time did he preach? Those are the three core questions. And depending on how you answer those questions, you come up with more or less five different views that have existed throughout the history of the church. And I'll lay those out really quickly. Five different views. The first view, this is the review of Augustine. It was very popular from those who uh, came after Augustine. This was this is the view that uh, Wayne Grudem takes. I've heard other people take this view too. And this is, we'll call this view number one. This is the view that this is all about Noah. All about Noah. That's one view. And, and, and what's going on here is not to say that Jesus, in between his death and resurrection, went and preached to, to Noah, to the people who were alive during the flood. Whoever these spirits are, they were connected. These The they here refers to these spirits. They existed and did something at the time of the days of Noah. So Augustine's view is that Jesus didn't go at his resurrection or before his resurrection. He didn't go and preach to the souls who were alive in the days of Noah, that all that Peter is saying is that Jesus was preaching back in the days of Noah to the disobedient souls. So by the Holy Spirit, Jesus is preaching through Noah back in those days. And that what happens in verse 20 does not refer to anything that takes place uh, during or after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. 
I have some problems with this view to say that all that is being said here is that Jesus spoke through Noah, that the spirits are the disobedient souls back then, that Jesus didn't do anything at his death and resurrection, that this is just merely stating something that happened a long time ago. I have a few problems with that. One, it doesn't make a lot of sense why bring it up at all at this point in the text, because there is a clear flow of thought going on here. Jesus is suffering for sins. He is put to death. He is made alive. You take the parenthesis that is verses 19 through 21, uh, and you kind of set that aside and you recontinue that theme, that narrative with the resurrection and the ascension into heaven and the subjection of angels, authorities, and powers to him. That seems to be a pretty chronological pattern going on in this text. He's di- he dies, he's resurrected, he ascends, and angels, authorities, and powers are subjected to him. And so to drop something in the middle that has nothing to do with what is overwhelmingly a chronological statement doesn't make a lot of sense to me. In fact, we can really connect this to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This text in 1 Timothy has a very similar formula. And if you'll notice in your Bibles that 1 Timothy 3.16 is set off in poetry. So this is likely a poetic statement that Paul is taking up. In fact, those who compiled the the Greek text that is commonly used today do the same thing in in verse 18 and 19. They put it in poetry form. So it looks like this is some type of formula that Peter is giving, and he has a little parenthesis in verses 20 through midway through 21 about Noah and about baptism. Look at the connections here. He was manifested in the flesh. He was put to death in the flesh. He was made alive in the spirit. He was vindicated by the spirit, which this does suggest that we should interpret the word spirit here as the Holy Spirit, which I think is probably right. He was seen by angels. Hmm, Is there a connection here to these spirits? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. He was proclaimed among the nations, believed on in glory, and he was uh, believed on in the world, and he was taken up into heaven or into glory. It's a lot of similarities there. In fact, it may be that same early Christian proclamation that's behind 1 Timothy 3.16 is also behind 1 Peter 3.18 through 22. So this looks looks and feels like a a statement about Jesus and the saving work, the work of salvation he accomplished at the cross and his resurrection. And so it doesn't make a lot of sense to go back and say there is no chronological connection between what Noah did and what Jesus did. That this is just merely stating that Jesus was at work back in those days. That's the first problem. The second problem, and I think an insurmountable problem with this view, is that the whole purpose of this exercise was to bring people to God. And if we're saying here that the analogy that Peter gives is that Jesus went and proclaimed to the unbelieving souls in the days of Noah, then Jesus was eminently unsuccessful in proclaiming salvation because they did not obey. And they were in no way brought to God. They were brought to their own death and destruction. The tone here is one of victory, of salvation, and and, and Jesus and the work he accomplished that put to shame the demons and devils of hell. That's the tone. And to give an illustration where Jesus would have been unsuccessful in proclaiming salvation doesn't seem to make any sense. And so I, I, and besides that, there's a lot of grammatical gymnastics people have to take that take the view that this is about Noah. So that's the first view, that this is all about Noah. The second view is that this is offering, put a slash here to separate, that this is offering a second chance at salvation. That's the second view. And that says something like this. There were those who did not obey in the past. Jesus went and proclaimed to them the message of salvation, and they had a chance to repent. And that is another view, that the souls who perished in the flood were offered a second chance that in between Jesus' death and resurrection, he went and proclaimed to them the message of salvation. I have a few problems with that. The first is why only these? Why only those who perished in the flood? Do they get a second chance and no one else does? That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Secondly, nowhere does it say that Jesus proclaimed the message of salvation or that they had another chance to repent. That is inferred, but that is never said in this text. In fact, the word, the normal word for spreading the gospel or preaching the good news is not the word that Peter uses here, which is just the word of a proclamation. So that's one view. The third view is that this is Jesus descending into hell to pronounce condemnation 
or to condemn all the Old Testament unbelievers. So similar to the previous view, this is about Jesus descending into hell in the interval between his death and resurrection, or, or perhaps after his resurrection. But instead of proclaiming a chance at repentance, he is proclaiming the message of condemnation. He's saying these unbelievers in the Old Testament, he has descended into hell and he has condemned them because he has conquered death through his death and resurrection. Something like that. Some view like that, that this is referring to unbelievers, but the proclamation is not that of salvation, but of damnation. Doesn't seem to work, I think, especially with the tone of bringing us to God. And it has a few other problems. No, the, the one obvious problem is the word spirits here. There's a really good case that the word spirit used in this context is it is unusual to refer to humans in the way that it, the text refers to these spirits. And so to say it's to Old Testament unbelievers, there is some grammatical evidence. Tom Schreiner points this out in his commentary that, that that's not exactly what is meant by the word spirits there. Secondly, it seems, again, against the tone of salvation, bringing us to God to say that he, he did all this that he might bring us to God. And oh, by the way, he went down to hell to tell them that they were all condemned, even though, in fact, they, they were already condemned in that sense. The fourth view is that Jesus went into the grave to release from bondage Old Testament saints. And this view might be inferred in some early Christian teaching on this. In particular, there is a homily on a, about Holy Saturday that was written probably in the second century. It's very good. I encourage you to go look it up on Google and read it. And it, it envisions Jesus descending into the grave and having this conversation with Adam. It's a kind of a hypothetical poem that talks about the salvation that Jesus worked. And so some say this is Jesus going into the tomb, freeing the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints, they are in prison. They were, in fact, in this realm because they could not finally be saved because Jesus had not come and done this work. And so in the interval between his death and resurrection, or perhaps after his resurrection, he goes into the, the realm of Hades and he proclaims to these dead saints that they have been saved. He didn't give them another chance. So there's no sense of second chance, but this is Jesus going into hell to proclaim to humans that they have been saved. I have a, I have a problem with that. Similar to the last view that it's just to condemn all unbelievers. The word spirit here, you're having, we're having to stretch the word spirit a little bit to get to that meaning. Secondly, why talk about Noah? Why connect it to Noah if it's all Old Testament saints? And that really applies to this third view as well. If it's to condemn all those in the Old Testament, why bring up Noah? It doesn't check that box. So there's some problems with that. And the, the fifth and final view, which I think is the view that makes the most sense, it's the view that I am most strongly aligned with, and that's the view that Jesus went into the grave to proclaim victory over the demons and devils of hell. There's a lot in the text that I really think lends to this conclusion. In fact, most Bible scholars today are coming to this conclusion. That Jesus is going into the spiritual world, to this realm, this prison, to proclaim not a second chance at repentance, but to proclaim victory. We have often in the West, we have lost sight of the fact that Jesus and his death and resurrection was a moment of victory over the demons and devils of hell. This is sometimes called Christus Victor. And instead, we have emphasized the forensic nature of our, our salvation, that he died to pay the debt for our sins, without regard to what that might have meant towards the devils and the fallen angels. And so this view has a lot working for it. The first, the first is that the word spirits here is more natural when referring to angels. The second is that if there is an overlap between 1 Timothy 3.16, what is being described here in verse 19 is what Paul means when he says Jesus was seen by angels. What Jesus did was not just visible to humans, it was visible to the entire spiritual world. He was seen by angels, these spirits in prison. Another reason this makes sense is because the language of spirits being locked up in prison is very similar to what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, equivalent also to Jude, the letter of Jude, which refers to angels being locked up in chains of darkness. So the spirits in prison, angels in chains of darkness, similar language. I believe Peter wrote both of these letters. And so you have the same kind of thought, the same type of, of viewpoint about angels being expressed in both of these letters. So the spirits in prison makes a lot of sense to refer 
to these angels who are locked up because of their fall. Next, another reason this makes sense is because it is a more natural use of the word proclaim, which does not mean preach the gospel, but could very easily mean to proclaim victory. And the last reason that, that we'll go through here, I think there probably are many others that tie this all together, is that when this text is concluded, he speaks of angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. This is, remember, this text is all about suffering unjustly and unfairly, but God is sticking with his church. And that in spite of all the, the ills, the, the persecution, the oppression going on, that things will be put to rights. And all throughout human history, the demons and devils of, uh, devils of hell have had their way. But Christ suffered, and it seemed unfair, but he got the last laugh. And so that's the fifth and the final view we'll consider, that this is Jesus after his death and resurrection by the Holy Spirit, proclaiming victory to the spirits in prison. Those spirits fell, the Bible records this, and in Jewish thought, there was a lot of association with the fall of these angels and with the days of Noah because of what is said in Genesis chapter six. So all of this checks the boxes. It explains why he talks about Noah. It explains why he uses the word for proclaim. It explains why he says spirits and not humans. It explains the prison language and it connects it with his conclusion in verse 22. And it also connects it with 1 Timothy 3.16, which might have the same material, core material in mind when this is all communicated. All right, enough said about the harrowing of hell. Let's get into verse 21. Now, I said at the start that there are some things in this text that are very clear. Now, the various views we just went over, there's a lot of things about that that's not exactly clear. This is not a salvation is issue. If you think it's in the days of Noah, that, that's fine. I, I don't see any reason to, to say that this is something that uh, we should get super worked up and fight over. There's certainly a truth to be told in these verses, but some of those things are unclear. Now, there are some things that are very clear. And what is clear about this text? First of all, Christ and his death is what brings us salvation. Second of all, baptism corresponds to this scenario he just described with Noah, and it is what now saves us. He does not say after saying Christ suffered for sins and he proclaimed his victory over all the demons and devils of hell, and now if we want to participate in this victorious salvation, we simply respond to the altar call and say a sinner's prayer. He doesn't say that. Or he doesn't say, we, we live a life of meritorious good works, and by our good works and saying uh, the right prayers and doing good deeds and doing penance that will earn salvation. He doesn't say that. But he says, our baptism corresponds to this situation with Noah, and it now saves us. Baptism is critical. And that is not a debatable point of this text. In fact, if baptism were some ancillary, incidental, unimportant part of the Christian experience, why insert baptism in a parenthetical that describes the work of the gospel? Because that's what he's doing. He's describing the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, the gospel. And in the middle of it, he talks about baptism. If baptism is unimportant, why do that? Well, it's very clear. Baptism is important. It now saves us. Now, it's not a removal of dirt from the body. It's not the water that's magical. It's not getting wet or getting physically clean that does anything, but it's the appeal to God through our baptism for a good conscience or because of a good conscience, we could possibly read that as. And it's done through the resurrection of Jesus. Now, baptism, the subject of baptism and its connection to the resurrection is clear in other passages, particularly Romans chapter 6. And he connects baptism to resurrection as a way of completing the formula of the gospel. Now Jesus has gone into heaven and all the angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Jesus did say all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him in Matthew chapter 28. This has been a deep dive and a longer begin in the word than usual. And I hope that you've been able to stick with us and follow through this very complicated text. But I want to call out that some things are not hard at all. And those who do not want to accept that baptism is a critical part of the Christian experience, that it is the moment that we are saved, we are regenerated, that we come in contact with the death and resurrection of Jesus. Those who want to deny that can't deny it because it's a complicated text. Because this text very simply says, 
Baptism now saves you. Thanks for joining us on Begin in the Word. It's my hope that just as you have begun today in the Word of God, you'll live out today in the Word of God.